Almost 40 years ago, there was a case in San Francisco. What? There was an office seeker, a politician, who literally killed the mayor of San Francisco. Why? Just because he had a personal disagreement with him. And in the fit of anger, he killed him. But what's more interesting is the defense that happened in the court. His lawyer argued that my client was actually having high blood sugar levels and due to that, he was more prone to committing such horrendous, morally abhorrent acts. But what makes it interesting is that this defense was pretty successful and this was known as the Twinkie defense. But whatever the result was, it was successful or not, what made this case interesting, especially for me as a neuroscience enthusiast, was the fact that what it told me about what goes on in our heads. This entire case literally tells that whatever goes on in here somewhat impacts the way we view reality, the way we respond to stimulus, and the way we respond to our environments in terms of our judgments and our understanding. And this may also apply to our moral judgments. Why? Because moral judgments at the end of the day are also a response to the stimulus of this entire process we witness. But this entire talk I just want to clarify that this is not meant to be a revolutionizing uh, impact in the academia. Why? Because neuroscientists like Robert Sapolsky, Joshua Green are already having some impactful research upon it. My sole purpose to give this talk in the first place is to inspire the Pakistani youth that does not know this beautiful field of science, the cognition and how it is manifested in our brains. So the target audience is none other than the Pakistani youth and to make them know how beautiful and complex the brain is. But before we move on, let's have some interaction and I would need you all to raise your hands depending upon whether you lie in your answers, right? So let's take a moral dilemma and a very cliche one, but an important one as well, a trolley problem. Let's assume that there's a train coming towards a point, right? And on its way, the brakes of the train have failed, right? And there's no way of stopping it at all. Now, the train driver has two options. There's a path diverging out of it. Either you can go to the right side or either you can move to the left side. But there's a problem. There's only one person on the right side who's working on the rail track. And on the left side, there are five persons who are working, right? So those of you who would move towards the person who, only one person who's working on the rail track, raise your hand and who would kill? Right. And those who would kill the five people out there, who would be those? Okay, so the majority stands with killing one person. Now just change the context of this all. Assume that you're witnessing this entire scene by standing on a bridge, right? And now, you see there's no other pathway. There's only a single track and there are five people on it. And now the only way to stop that train is to throw someone or something in front of it. And just beside you, there's a person you absolutely hate. Would you throw him onto the rail track just to save five people? Those of you who do, raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> that's a considerable amount who would do that. Okay, so what does this tell us about ourselves? A moral brain. Do we literally have something moral going on in our brains or there's something, a very good human cortex in our heads that actually determine those who have it are a good person and those who do not have it as a bad person? Uh, actually, no. Everything for us humans depends upon the context and the context of the situation we are living in. But despite that, there are certain mechanisms that exist in our head that ultimately lead to us formulating a judgment calculating a judgment. And we would be looking at those judgments from a very neuroscientific perspective. There can be a social neuroscientific perspective that looks at the evolutionary pathway of how we lived in the society, but this is not going to be about it. It's going to look at certain regions that play a role, right? So a lot of neuroscientists or psychologists over the years have argued that whether our moral judgments are impacted by our emotions or by our thinking processes, right? and the debate goes on. But recent researches literally show that it's a mixture of both. Nothing can be absolute at every single situation. Therefore, both processes go hand in hand. So there is a whole world that lives inside, but there are two major portions, the amygdala and the frontal cortex. So 
the amygdala is actually a part that looks after the aggression or the fearful part of your personality, while the frontal cortex is sort of an all-rounder. It looks after your emotions, it looks after your memories, it looks after every single other relatable thing, your intelligence. Unfortunately, this part made us incredibly intelligent in the course of evolution. But let's understand some textbook analysis of this entire situation. You see a stimulus. You see something, you hear something, you smell something, right? There's a stimulus that goes into your head as a signal, right? And that signal reaches your amygdala before your frontal cortex, right? And due to that, your amygdala generates a very emotional response. Let's take an example. You have a friend who's being extremely irritating, right? He takes your sandwich and runs away, right? And what does your amygdala say? Okay, he has done something bad, now go and punch him, he has taken your sandwich. A very aggressive response. Now, by the time this amygdala has generated the response, we do not even know it. We are not, only con we are not consciously aware that our amygdala has created a response, right? This happens hundreds of milliseconds before our frontal cortex comes into action. And what does the frontal cortex do? It goes like, okay, we need to be patient, right? It gives us an emotional regulation out there. That, okay, be patient. No matter how bad the situation is, let's be patient and let's have some other option. Just do not punch him. We can like just shout at him or do any other stuff, right? So that emotional regulation takes place in our frontal cortex. So we should be thankful to him that our friends are not bleeding their noses for everything they have done to us, right? So even in our frontal cortexes, there are certain portions and this is where it becomes really exciting. You just do not need to get scared by the name, right? I would be explaining that. So the ventromedial prefrontal cortex out there is something that is present by opening our brains. Our brain has two parts. Once we open it, the internal structure inside it is the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And it is the part that makes us acquainted with social norms and as well as emotions like sympathy or empathy that are extremely important in our lives. For example, if you're at a shadi and there's a, like, a child running around, you become agitated. But anything, or if there's anything that's stopping you from slapping that child, is that this part, that that's a child, be empathetic towards him, be sympathetic towards him, right? So be thankful to this part, right? So it, this does not mean that this part is not emotional, it just regulates the emotion. It just makes you, okay, you can just feel burnt inside, just do not slap him. I'm not stopping you, just do not slap him. That's bad, social norm does not allow it, right? So that's why it's the part that's most important in this entire regard. But as it's the emotional part, there needs to be an antithesis of rationality as well. So what controls the rational part, right? So that is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, right? So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, what does it do? You remember when we were talking in a dilemma, you all did a very important calculation. That was like, I am going to save one person and uh, I'm going to save five people instead of one person. Why? On a cost benefit analysis, right? So this is the part that comes into action, right? Your, this part of the brain is actually quite necessary in making utilitarian, consequential cost benefit analysis. This means that it gives you two options and you weigh both of them just because of it. Okay, I have two options. A has better consequences, B does not. Therefore, I would choose option A, right? But there's an important factor that comes into it as well. You all are students, right? So whenever there's no invigilator in the classroom, there's hope, probably a chance of cheating, right? And most of you might look at other sheets, right? And go like, okay, just bata de, right? But some of you would, ardently believe in mehnat ki azmat, right? And feel like I am in a constant dilemma, right? And due to that constant dilemma that's going on in your head, that one side is telling you, okay, this might get you more marks, but one side goes like, no, this is wrong. That entire dilemma, that entire cost benefit analysis comes from this part. So if you are having good marks by cheating, say thanks to this part. And if you are not having, then also be thankful to this part. It is the one that's calculating it all in the first place. But there's another portion that is really necessary to understand. And that my personal favorite that, uh, about this topic is the insular cortex, right? There are certain things that you literally see, hear, or even smell, and you go like, what's that, right? Like, there are certain things we do not even witness. We just cannot imagine them even. 
let's take the example of incest, right? A very triggering uh, topic for many of us. And as soon as we hear it, we are disgusted to our core. We feel nauseous. That's due to this part. And this has something really interesting twist to it. How? Because insular cortex is not only necessary for our moral disgust, but this is the part that controls our taste-related and smell-related disgust as well. For example, if you have a bad chai, someone who, uh, uh, or something, any bad food, you feel disgusted, you feel nauseous, okay, what's this? Or if, even if you smell something bad, you go like, that's disgusting, right? Now, this part also has the similar role. That actually happened why? Because in 50,000 years ago, when we humans started to make civilizations and started to create our social norms, our bodies were like, okay, too much energy to create a new organ, let's just give the responsibility to the previously existing organ right now, right? So due to that, we got this moral discuss, morally discussed providing organ known as the insular cortex, right? But here's a question, a food for thought though, that if our olfactions and tastes and the disgust caused by them has a similar site as uh, that uh, that is also present in our moral disgust then how can we believe in the authenticity of our judgments the authenticity of our moral judgments for example can we think about it as if we enter a room and there is something a bad olfaction or something bad in our mouth that tastes bad and ultimately we might due to the working of our brain create a morally immoral judgment of that entire situation because the site remains the same. A food for thought, that is. But let's see what goes wrong in the psychopaths then, as we compare this entire process in the brain. What are psychopaths actually characterized by? Their unsocial behavior, their ruthlessness, and their aggressive nature. As per the case of Phineas Gage, a person who literally lost the frontal part of his head or brain, ultimately developed all of these characteristics and due to that we see that the important factor that play in this psychopathic behavior is a ventromedial prefrontal cortex that ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, when it is absent ultimately leads to more consequential and more utilitarian responses this means that all you care about is your own benefit all you care about is your own pleasure or all you care about is a hardcore emotion Therefore, ventromedial prefrontal cortex ultimately develops into the formation of psychopathic behavior. So this entire talk can lead us to some important idea, and that is the understanding of criminal behavior in the very first place. The way we approach them, and the way we approach that entire problem. If we tend to see criminals in the terms of what goes on in their heads, we might be able to eradicate that entire problem rather than just treating the symptom in the first place. And secondly, another food for thought is that even if that amygdala, as we discussed, has uh, does not allow us to even be consciously aware of the decisions it made. So do we really have a free will in the first place? And if there's no free will, how do we approach the criminal justice system in the first place? And if there's a limitation, then how do we give that entire retribution, that entire punishment in the criminal justice system? So all these questions have complex answers, but these uh, complex answers are the only beautiful thing in the universe that we are about to explore. And Due to this, everyone who is interested in neuroscience, interested in brain and its complexities and the melodious symphonies it sings, best of luck for your journey. Thank you.